But if you get a large bird, such as a hawk or something on a cross arm on a pole, if he's sitting on that one, but if he spreads his wings out and he makes contact with the other phase or to the ground on that, then now we have KFC, right? So equipotential zone is a key aspect of temper protected ground. Hey, and welcome to the Electrical Safety Podcast. I'm your host, John Travis, and today I'm speaking with George Cole. George is an electrical safety consultant at Palo Verde Nuclear Generation Station. And uh, George, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you, John. Honored to be here. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. And um, I guess we usually just kind of kick things off to give people a bit of a background on how the guests either got into the electrical world and then found them, you know, found their way into safety. So if you give us a bit of a background story to kick things off, that'd be great. Sure. Well, I'll keep it condensed. So, um, uh, during a previous, um, uh, relationship marriage, uh, my former father-in-law was an electrician in the air force here in the United States and later on with one of the cities. And, uh, at the time I didn't know anything about electrical. You know, I just knew that I didn't want to touch the black wire or the white wire and I shouldn't touch them together. But he started showing me the ropes and, uh, started explaining certain concepts to me. And then he needed help on certain jobs that he, he had a side job. At which point then I thought to myself, well, his name was John. If John can learn this. I think I can learn it because I find this very interesting. So consequently, um, I pursued a career, um, moved from one field to another into the realm of, uh, as an electrician. Um, I, as you said, I worked for the Palo Verde nuclear generating station and it's, uh, owned and operated by Arizona public service company, uh, the largest utility in Arizona that provides, uh, distribution and transmission and generation throughout Arizona. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, once, uh, I got my foot in the door, uh, I worked in different aspects of the company in electrical, uh, worked in substations for a period of time, transmission, distribution, and substations. From there, um, moved back to the generation part of the plant here at Palo Verde in 2008 as electrician, journeyman electrician maintenance, plant maintenance type. And from there, um, slowly started migrating into the electrical safety part. Um, as we, as Palo Verde decided to become a OSHA program called the Voluntary Protection Program, VPP. We realized maybe there was some areas in electrical safety that we needed help in. So my manager asked me if I would be interested in this uh, opportunity to help the station, but also to improve my knowledge, which to me was an awesome uh, experience and, and an opportunity. So I accepted and consequently, uh, that's how I ended up moving away from the tools as an electrician to the safety aspects of doing electrical work. And then from there, I know you went on to, to get a few certifications in that. So can you, you know, a lot of people maybe have heard of these CESCP stuff like that. Can you just kind of elaborate on what exactly those are? And then, you know, maybe why you were thinking that would be beneficial to you and, and uh, maybe a little bit too, I'm curious on the process of how to, how to get it. Sure. So, uh, back in 2017, I made a, a decision that, you know, the NFPA national fire protection association had some safety certifications. One was a CESCP certified electrical safety compliance professional. And the other was the CESW certified electrical safety worker. At the time, um, the compliance professional was targeting those who were working within, um, the safety program as administrator, developing programs, documents, rules, procedures, et cetera, which really kind of fit into the realm that I did, that I was performing. At the same time, I was still an electrician by trade tournament. So I figured, well, it, it, to get the best of both worlds, I'll get both certifications. So. Uh, you have to fill out an application you have to put down your history to make sure you qualify for it. And then from there, um, if you're accepted, you, you have to pay your funds, of course, you know, the administrative fees. Mm -hmm. 
And then they set you up with a testing gate at an independent testing facility. For me, it was in the city of Phoenix. So I went out there and, and, and I, I did both certification within the same day. And they don't tell you immediately, but afterwards, you know, within a week or so, you'll find out if you passed or not, which uh, thankfully I did. So that's how I um, got my two certification through the NFPA. <clears throat> Consequently, though, the CESW, the electrical safety worker, has been changed now to the CEST, the Certified Electrical Safety Technician, and they're the um, Category 1 and Category 2, just an FYI. Yeah. So with those, like, is that something that an electrical worker would want to have to further their career, get more opportunities? Like, I'm just not sure. I'm curious on kind of how that fits in. I would encourage everybody. So if you're an electrician type uh, or your primary role is doing field work, the, the new CEST 1 and 2 would be the, the route that I would encourage you. It's designed for that frontline worker or those who oversee that work from a pragmatic approach, right? Mm -hmm. The guy's touching the equipment. Where the CESP is more for the program administrator developer. So if you're in a safety position, safety manager, safety consultant, the uh, compliant professional certification would be more applicable to what you would be doing. Both of them, you know, use the NFPA 70E as the foundation. So that's what you'll be tested on during the examination for the certifications. Okay. Great. So I guess, um, you know, we were chatting earlier and you mentioned that you, you know, you're into training, you're into auditing, you're into helping people with their electrical safety programs. And, you know, you mentioned practical and pragmatic. I'm just curious, um, more on the auditing front, um, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, you know, I think a lot of companies out there would entertain the idea of an electrical safety audit, but they're maybe not quite sure what it is that you'd even be looking at. I think a lot of people get really hung up on the equipment versus people and safety. And so, you know, when you're, when you're approaching an audit, what, what are the, what are the things that you're thinking about? Well, I think it's a multifaceted approach, right? So it's. The electrical safety program is a, a document like a procedure, or I shouldn't say it isn't limited to just that written documents. Those are very, very important to have by all means, but it also encompasses your training programs. It encompasses the behaviors of your workers in the field, their knowledge. Do they understand the rules? More importantly, when they're out there in the field, are they applying the safety rules as it applies to their particular jobs? So when when we do an audit, we look at these different parts, right? In a good audit, depending on the size of the company, will take anywhere from a couple of days to maybe a week, just a little bit more. But you're sharing, you're digging through those details, you're interviewing employees, you're sometimes going to the field and observing work. So this gives you a good, strong feeling where the worker is in comparison to maybe the standard that they're supposed to be following. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, if the basis documents that they're using, their procedures and safety rules are inadequate or their training is inadequate, then that's going to reflect on their knowledge in the field. Oftentimes you'll find individuals who are very, very technically uh, savvy. They know the equipment. They know how to troubleshoot. They know how to, you know, make the equipment back into its normal state again. At the same time, the safety aspects of how we, you know, we perform those tasks can be um, challenging from the role of safety. Mm. Um, for example, most apprenticeships, when you go through it, they have some high level safety requirements, but it never gets down into the meat of, of electrical safety. You know, yeah, they know that electric, electrical energy can hurt or kill you. Don't get shocked. Here's your PPE. Don't get burnt through an arc flash. Here's the arc flash PPE. But it's real high level. When it comes into the field, sometimes um, the the practical side of it isn't always there. Not to say it isn't, but 
you'll notice that. So by accompanying workers in the field and observing the work will help you judge where they're at. It, mm -hmm. Again, each individual is a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, you know, let's say you did an audit on a company or a facility or something <laughs> and you, you observe that the workers maybe just quite aren't there in their knowledge and their behavior with electrical safety. So, you know, now we're moving the conversation to training. Um, you know, I, I do think that a lot of people out there, a lot of training that would be considered, you know, arc flash or electrical safety, most of it seems to be called arc flash training, really uh, is not focused on how do I do this job safely? And it seems to be more focused on here are the hazards. You know, this is an arc flash, what it looks like. Don't touch it. You know, how do you kind of bridge that gap between just almost like scare tactics to practical hands-on approach in training? Well, you know, here in the U.S., you know, to be a qualified electrical worker, there's a two-part provision. You know, it's, it encompasses those two parts, encompasses a lot more. But essentially, the individual to be qualified electrical worker has to be trained and knowledgeable of the equipment design and function. And then the second part is to be trained in the safety related work practices for that equipment. Mm -hmm. So if you have, let's say, a, a lower voltage technician who never is exposed to anything greater than 600 volts, they definitely have a shock potential and they can also have an arc flash potential, right, uh, for working in, in their equipment. But when it comes to temporary protective grounding and that type of a scenario, they probably don't need the temporary protective grounding training if they will never hang ground or remove ground or work under the protection of temporary protective grounds. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the training needs to be specific to first, what, what does the individual do? Second, the hazard associated with that work. And then thirdly, um, the regulation that drive that particular type of, um, activity. Right. Right. Actually, you mentioned something that kind of reminds me of a question that seems to come up, um, whether I notice comments online or, or something like that is around temporary protected grounds in a, you know, a more manufacturing setting. So we're not talking transmission lines and, and all that stuff. We're talking metal enclosed switch gear, maybe lower voltage switch gear. So 40 volt, 600 volt. Um, I think people think they need to ground or they want to ground, but there's nowhere to ground. So in a, in a case like that, um, like how do you approach that? I don't, I don't know if that's a, well, you know, and I'm not familiar with every style of switch gear out there, but most of your medium voltage switch gear, when you purchase them, most of them, your major companies that manufacture them will provide you uh, a device called a a ground truck or mm -hmm. ground buggy. And essentially it's a, a breaker with all the guts ripped out. And so you have the bushings, either three bushings or six bushings. And from there, that's racked up into the bus. And then you will ground out either the line shot or the load side, using your standard floor out or whatever the size ground and cables that you need. Mm -hmm. So with switch gear, um, it, it can be challenging at times. Now, it also depends on the model and the type of switch gear. If you go into the back part of the enclosure, that's where the field leads or the load leads will go from the switch gear out to the motor, the transformer, or whatever. Some places like our plant, we call them affectionately ground spiders. We can then open up the back cubicle door where the bus connection is and the field wires are mm -hmm. where they bolt together. They have a, a non-conducted boot, a plastic boot over it, but we can drop those boots and physically attach the grounds at that point. That, and that will ground the cable going to the motor, to the transformer, whatever the load device might be. Right. So it's very doable in, in several different uh, applications. Yeah. So here's, okay. So then the next thing I would think about is you mentioned earlier, qualified electrical worker, skills and knowledge in the equipment and the safety related work practices that are involved in working on that equipment. 
So let's say we've got uh, a company who has to do something like you just described with grounding the medium voltage switch gear. I think a lot of them out there feel they can send their workers to a generic electrical safety and arc flash course. And then when they come back, which they probably haven't gone through the medium voltage grounding of transformers, but then they come back and they think, oh, they're qualified now. So, you know, what's your, you know, would you kind of argue with them a little bit on that? Or maybe not argue is the right Well, I don't know if I'd argue, but I would probably have to remind them, you know, um, being a qualified employer, you have to be able to demonstrate the skills. So that was the other part of the qualified electrical worker I may have left out, that the individual has to be able to demonstrate the skill sets necessary to abate or to eliminate that hazard, the electrical hazard. With temporary protective grounding, just because you go through a course, that gives you some good foundation understanding. But ultimately, it has to be proven that you can demonstrate the proper application, right? Mm -hmm. So if you work under the utility regulations here in the United States, uh, according to OSHA, you know, to attach and remove the grounds to the normally energized part, you have to use a lifeline tool, hot stick, for example. Other than if the system is less than 600 volts, then you're allowed to use an alternative insulation method. And most times people consider that rubber, your know, class zero or class one or class two, depending on the voltage system, to attach. 7E does not go into that detail. Obviously, they're not, you know, it's not designed for utility companies. But 7D also requires temporary protective grounding if there is, you know, chances of induced voltage or, you know, energizing the system that you're going to be putting into an electrical safe work condition. Mm -hmm. Same principles, I believe, still apply. The key being an echo potential zone. And that's probably mm -hmm. a topic that we shouldn't cover at this point, but uh, at a high level, an echo potential zone just means if I, if the, if I as the worker, whatever I'm touching, that buzz or that line, if it becomes inadvertently energized because of a human performance mistake or equipment failure, mm -hmm. that part I'm touching will become energized. Well, if I, my body becomes energized at the same rate as that part I'm touching for the voltage to rise and to drop then I'm in a potential zone. And if you remember, current only flows if you have a difference of electrical potential. If you have the same potential, current doesn't flow between two points. You know, it's the old bird on the wire concept. If yep. you see birds landing on power lines, they don't go poof, right? As long as they stay on that one phase. But if you get a large, you know, bird such as a hawk, a raptor or something on a cross arm on a pole, if he's sitting on that one phase, but if he spreads his wings out and he makes contact with the other phase or to the ground on that, then now that bird is at two different potentials. Current will flow from one to the other through the bird. And now we have KFC, as you know, right? So echo potential zone is very, very, um, it's a key aspect of temper protective grounding. And there is actually, if you think about it, Maybe it's outside of the scope of this conversation, but bare hand work, live line bare hand work where these guys in transmission systems will go up and physically touch a live line at 151 kV, 500 kV, 345 kV. They're actually relying on an echo potential zone to keep them alive because they, their body is at that same potential. Hmm. Consequently, they don't get shocked. So. That's kind of the thought of the, you know, temper protected ground. I know I probably got into a little more detail than I no, should have, great. but uh, grounding is a very important aspect, but if it's not done correctly, it's dangerous. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, I heard this a long time ago that grounding was sort of the black magic of electrical engineering and electricity. And it just seems like a lot of people are confused on that topic. So I'm sure they'll, they'll get some benefit out of that analogy. Um, I know you're, you're, uh, looking at presenting here coming up at the IEEE, uh, ESW, oh, yes. uh, just, you know, you don't need to give us the whole speech. Obviously you want to save that for them, but just for people kind of listening and that might be attending, you know, what, what is the topic going to be? And, and, uh, maybe just elaborate a little bit on it if you, if you will. Sure. 
you know, obviously I, I won't let the whole cat out of the bag, but I can put out a couple of teasers. Yeah. So I'll be presenting a paper, a paper is titled, does NFPA 70, the National Electrical Code and NFPA 70E stand for electrical safety in the workplace add safety value for electric utilities. And the reason I picked that particular topic is, um, if we look, anybody's familiar with both the National Electrical Code and the NFPA 70E under Article 90, there are the covered aspect and the not covered, meaning those industries and companies that would be, that would fall under the jurisdiction of either one of the code or the standards. Mm -hmm. Electric utilities are technically not covered for, for using NFP 70 or 70E, but that needs quantified. That is for the parts of the plant that's generation, transmission, distribution, and, and anything that supports that directly. However, not if it's not directly related to generation transmission distribution, such as offices, warehouses, um, garages, et cetera, that building that structure could be owned by the electric utility company, but it still has to meet and be installed according to the national electrical code yeah. and really the practices should be with an NFPA 70 E. Uh, for those that don't know, within the electric utility industry, we have our own code. It's called the National Electrical Safety Code, NESC, and it primarily looks at um, the transmission distribution side of the house. It does have a little footprint there, and it does cover generation, including um, batteries and, and photovoltaic type stuff. And so my paper is trying to show the industry, the electric utility industry, of which I work in, to consider using these two documents voluntarily to enhance your electrical safety program where it applies. We know not every part of the electrical safety uh, NFPA 70E or the National Electrical Code will apply to every part of a transmission line. Mm -hmm. But those parts that do, like inside the substation in the control house, or better yet, a generation plant. You know, if you look at our typical power generation plant, if you, you know, barring the main generator, your generator step up transformers, your excitation systems, most everything else in a generation plant mimics of a, a large industrial facility like petrochemicals or oil refineries, switch gear, duct banks, motor control centers, batteries, battery chargers, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So. If there is applicability for those other industries using these standards to keep their people safe, it would behoove us to really research those and then, you know, mine those nuggets from those other standards that will help keep our employees safe. Yeah. So, so yeah, so if generation falls under the utility, that just made me think like fundamentally solar, wind, uh, all of these other types of, gen do those fall under NFPA 70E? Well, technically no, if they're generate, if so, it kind of depends. So if it's cogen, meaning, okay, if you have a generation facility on site and you're the customer of your own generation, then NFPA 70 would more than likely apply. Okay. If you're selling the power oh. though, to an external customer, you're not utilizing it for yourself. And that makes you really a generation company, uh, very similar to a utility company that I work for, right? You may not send out the same megawatts out there, but if you're, or, or wheeling it out to the grid and you have customers purchasing it, then in the United States, you would fall under 1910-269, um, subpart R okay. for electric utilities, generation and transmission. With that said, um, I think it. Each industry will have to look at it differently, but regardless of, and this, I'm a simple guy. If we have a hazard, be it shock or arc flash, and the equipment is similar or identical, we be less than, um, I'm trying to think of the word now. I'm sorry. We just went away. We'd be less than, um, reasonable to not at least consider 
implementing these practices yeah. to keep our people safe. I'm curious, and I've never looked into it, but with like the standards that govern utility, um, if you just kind of compared pound for pound, uh, line by line, the practices in there compared to NFP 70E when it comes to safety, you know, are there like glaring holes? Um, you know, I'm thinking like just establishing an electrically safe work condition, energized work permits, like this, this stuff, like, is it fundamentally still there? Just worded a little bit differently or. Well, I think it, de- yeah. Are there so I think it depends on what part of the utility you work in, you yeah. know, for a transmission distribution system. It's going to be more challenging to implement, you know, yeah. many parts of 70 to them. But within generation, I think, in my opinion is, because I see it done, uh, it's very practical and it's very easy to align. Okay. And so the industry that I work in specifically, the nuclear power industry, we, the nuclear power generation industry has been proactively trying to increase electrical safety within our field for several years now. I actually, I'm a member of our industry working group. Um, we have a specialized group of indos, individuals from different nuclear power plants across the U.S. and including a few from Canada. We meet on a monthly basis to f- try to develop some standards within our groups that all the plants can adopt, but it's using as the basis for most of those NFPA 70E because we see the benefits of this. So this industry working group for electrical safety in the nuclear industry, we recognize that NFPA 70E provides us so much that we don't have with just the OSHA regulations in and of itself. Yeah. And those north of our border yeah. up in Canada, Z462 does the same thing for them. Yeah. What's the name of that group? I'm just curious. Yeah. We just call ourselves the IWG, Industry Working Group for Electrical Safety in the Nuclear Industry. Okay. Yeah, but uh, hopefully other parts of the utility companies, uh, such as fossil generation, hydro generation, even parts of the transmission distribution side of the house would at least look at, you know, what, what can I pull out of there that will help keep my workers safe or yeah. make them safer, if you would like to use that term. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, I mean, I, I have thought similar thoughts in the past uh, i don't have too much experience with generation but that is one thing i noticed is it looks an awful lot like you know any other manufacturing facility out there so when you break it down by the components of the electrical components right so yeah no this has been uh this has been fantastic george i think it's a good uh kind of time to wrap things up here i know um i guess if you want to just give us a bit more information on when the IEEE is and maybe where people could, uh, could look you up, uh, to, if they want to get it, you know, get in on the action and, and, uh, and, uh, visit the presentation, uh, when is that coming up? So the IEEE uh, electrical safety workshop conference will be uh, held from March the 4th through March the 9th this year. So you have a um, little more, a little less than a month now, apparently. Yeah. No, nope, February 1st, so a little yeah. more in Tucson, Arizona. And, uh, I know that, uh, a lot of the rooms at the, the hotel venue are being taken up, but they do have an overflow. But if you just do a Google search and I triple I E E E space E S W 2024, that will take you right to their website. And I would encourage everybody and anyone, if you can attend. I think you would be very, very well served. You'll hear a host of people around from around the world, experts. You know, I I don't consider myself an expert, but there are people like Lanny Floyd and Lloyd Gordon, Zahir Juma, and so many others. I'm just throwing names out there mm-hmm. that are recognized around not just the United States but internationally as being experts in electrical safety. And you'll hear these individuals present papers. You get to meet them, even talk to them privately sometimes mm-hmm. to just get a, a better thought. I've learned so much, you know, I've attended many other types of conferences, safety conferences, and they tend to cover all forms of safety, right? 
chemical or, or fire protection and, and in the gamut to find spaces. And those are important. Don't get me wrong. I don't minimize them in any ways. But if you're looking for specifically electrical safety, this IEEE ESW is, I think, will help. And you'll be very, very pleased if you go. Yeah. Now, I've heard it called uh, the Super Bowl of electrical safety before. So it, <laughs> I've been That's there. That's probably a good description. Uh, George, it's been fantastic. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you again, John. My pleasure to be here. And hopefully you have a good day. Bye now.